is now released. That's the one that has like the extra, you know, the extra time. So if you look on Canvas, it has both like a due date, but also an available until. And basically, so long as you can upload it, so that available until is the effective due date, but then there's no late policy. So you just can't turn in late. Whereas most homeworks, we have a due date and then a 20% per day, and then they disappear once 100% goes away. But in this one, uh, I basically am going to give you extra time so that everybody has plenty of time to see the material in the lecture as well as ahead of time. So, and that also, uh, this sort of expedited schedule for these two homeworks ensures that solution sets will be available before the midterm. So next week I'll start posting some materials for the midterm. So I think I'm actually going to post solution sets for at least two of the prior midterms. So those will be real midterms. So look out for those. There's also this Canvas Activity F that once E1, so lecture E1, that's what Tuesday's lecture is, E1 will disappear on Tuesday, and then F will be released. And it basically randomly samples from all of the ICAs before it, and you can complete that ICA as many times as you want, and it'll just take the highest score. And so that's meant to be a midterm review. And it's due uh, for lecture F, which is basically a week after E1, and lecture F will be a midterm review. And, uh, and then you'll have a weekend, and then the midterm will be on the Tuesday following that, which I think I think is October 3rd or 8th. I forget eighth. which one. 8th. Okay. Then, yeah, it's whatever the Tuesday is of those. And uh, so you'll have a weekend to study for that and ask any questions. I'm also hoping that people will ask questions during that lecture F that will be coming up, this midterm review, because uh, I'm just going to prepare kind of sample slides that I think will jog your memory on the stuff we've gone over. But uh, if there's particular questions, uh, so like it's in particular for lectures E1 and E2, we're going to see a lot of things like E1, how to generate random numbers, like what you've done on, on homework C2, and then E2, how to generate random variants and in a number of different ways. And so that's where most of the quantitative stuff is. That's where usually a lot of the questions are. So I'm hoping that people have questions like that for F that we can work out as needed. Otherwise, I've just got some samples that I'll go through uh, as, and then hopefully that will also generate questions. So that's kind of the plan here. So in prepping for your midterm, if you want, you can start you know, building a two-sided handwritten formula sheet that you can bring in. Uh, optional, but uh, available, you know, allowed. I say handwritten, but I really just mean produced by you. So not photocopied out of a book, not photocopied off of a homework assignment. If you want to hand copy a homework assignment, a homework solution, something out of the book, that's fine. I just need you to generate it or type it yourself as opposed to actually just copying it, photocopying it. Uh, so then uh, other reminders, the Rockwell uh, automation a competition. I think the, de the deadline to submit is September 30th. I think it's similar for the IASC Flex sim sim uh, simulation competition. And there's a couple others as well, like the Simeo competition that might actually have like a 24th deadline. I'm not quite sure. But um, the big one most people focus on when they focus on one of these is this arena competition because it's the package we use here in the class. But it's optional. 
but if you choose to do it, then you can use this for your final project instead of the normal final project that you would do, where you'll have to gather data from, say, you know, some, uh, something on campus or near Tempe or maybe a family business and then model it. Here, they give you the problem, they give you the challenge, and they give you the data, and then you have to model that. They tend to be a little more complicated, they're a little more uh, realistic, I guess, to what you would see if you did simulation in as a professional. Uh, but they give you all the data, so at least you don't have to go through the hassle of collecting all that data. So it ends up being, uh, I've, we've had very successful teams like do some really nice submissions for these. And then if it really works out well, then you can get these monetary prizes. Not for me. But. So um, any questions on any of the administrative stuff? I know that uh, there are still some lab ones and homework B ones have not been returned, and I'm really leaning on the TAs to get those graded. Uh, you know, the latest lean was yesterday, and there was some ultimatums given by the end of the week. So hopefully, we'll see some of those returned, so you have a better idea of what your scores are so far. But other than that, any questions? Okay. So just uh, from where we, where we're sort of moving from last time, again we're modeling, we're 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 emulating this idea that uh, our eventual DES simulation models are trying to capture realistic variation, variation you would expect in a real system, like people arriving to an airport. In order to do that, they use randomness as a source of that variation, as opposed to coming up with some crazy deterministic model that sometimes uh, gives you a small arrival, inter-arrival time, sometimes gives you a large, and so on. As long as we pick the parameters of certain probabilistic distributions, then hopefully we end up getting variation that looks realistic. And so after the midterm, you're going to take data on real, on real variation that you see in the, in the, and then you need to, that's fine, please. Uh, and so after the midterm, you're actually going to take data, and we'll, we will learn methods in the input modeling lectures for how to fit models to those data. For now, we're just saying, imagine if you had those models, how, what do we do with them? Or how might you start thinking about choosing those models? But then we'll get into the nitty gritty of how you actually pick them based on data after the midterm. So stochasticity, this general approach, is a view that, in, that we use randomness as if it's real, even if we think it may not be. And another view is that stochasticity is modeling noise, which is induced by uncertainty in our model. So if we build a simplistic model, we know it's not quite right, then we know that there's going to be some residual, some gap between our model and reality, and we model that residual as noise. And stochasticity is, uh, you know, another perspective here is we're coming up with the right distributions of that residual. And so that's the general approach. Because we're dealing with randomness, we have to go back into some fundamentals of probability because we're going to be using probabilistic models. And so last time we introduced the sample space, usually denoted by omega, which is a set of all outcomes that can happen in the real world. And event is a subset of the set of all outcomes. And so the sample space in itself is an event with probability one. And then, in a, but and a generic event is a subset of that, so some subset of outcomes. And each one of those events we can assign a probability to. So the probability of the sample space is equal to one, and any subset of all possible outcomes that could occur are going to be a probability between zero and one. And so that's kind of mathematically the foundations of where we're going with probability. And I made all these analogies to weight. And then a random variable, that's where we actually add numbers to the outcome. And that is a mapping from the outcomes to the real numbers. So that when we say we want the probability that x is between 0 and 5, what we actually mean is this compli more complicated mathematical statement where we want the probability of the subset of the sample space that causes the random variable to map those outcomes between 0 and 5. So if you take you know, a, a more advanced course in probability or statistics, then this is the notation you frequently use. But in practice, we use shorthands like this. So this is what they mean over here. So my pointer is about dead, but this is about what they mean over here. So this is what we'll use in the class, but I at least want you to become familiar with the more rigorous perspective which is, um, you know, this, 
this view here and this idea that it's a mapping from a sample space to numbers. We use this Rx, the range x, and that's just the kind of list of numbers that could possibly result from the outcomes that could possibly result. So the range is going to determine whether it's a continuous variable, a discrete variable, and so on. So any questions about these definitions? Sample space, event, probability measure, random variable, range. Hopefully a lot of these are review from 380 or maybe refinements of things from 380. Okay. So uh, then you have discrete random variables. So we're going to talk about several of those today. We define a discrete random variable as something where its range is countable. So it has a, a set of outcomes that you can not, uh, you enumerate, so you can count them, and that's what makes them discrete. So they might be infinite, they might be finite, but as long as you can count them, that's what this discrete range is. For uh, that we use this additional shorthand, little p xi, we say that's the probability that the random variable has this particular outcome. And so this shorthand is shorthand for this shorthand, which is shorthand for that long set builder uh, notation. But so when you see a little p, that's what I'm sort of calling the probability mass function. That's the probability of a discrete outcome. And so we denote these probability mass functions as these graphs that look like this one. And I usually am going to put little dots at the head of these pins, indicating that there is a, an actual probability at that outcome, as opposed to a density. And that's the next slide. And so I'm not going to test you over this, but um, formally we call each one of these little lines that has concentrated mass at one point what's known as a delta measure. And so it's something that, uh, whereas in a density function, if I were to just draw a density here at any particular point, we say there's no mass at a point, there's only density. Here, we're actually loading up points with mass. And so the way in which we do that formally is with this thing called a <coughs> delta measure. Again, for this class, it's not going to matter too much, but just trying to be more familiar with the terms that you might see in later classes dealing with probability of random variables. All right, so then the continuous random variable, we don't use these density, we don't use mass at one point. We smear out the density over uh, the, the, all of the range. So the range is now a continuous interval or collection of such intervals. And because it's a continuous interval, we can weigh the interval. But at any point in the interval, we can't weigh just a point. The, the weight of any point, if I take a slice of a table, the weight of that slice, if it's infinitesimally small, is zero. But the table has density, and the whole table has weight. So the whole interval has weight, even though each slice, like this slice here, is zero. So the probability of any particular outcome is always zero but the probability of a range of outcomes is finally non-zero. And so that's the distinction here. And so these density functions don't have to be bounded between zero and one. They can be very, very large because you can have an area underneath a curve that's equal to one, even though the curve goes way above one. Because if the density is really high in one spot and really low in the others, the area underneath that density might still be equal to 1. So density functions can be anything 0 or higher, even though probabilities are bounded between 0 and 1. So these are our properties of density functions. Um, if I am referring to multiple random variables, you'll see me use a subscript. So f sub x, that means the density associated with random variable x, f sub y, the density associated with random variable y. Densities are always non-negative. The integral underneath them is equal to 1, even though they do not have to be bounded by 1. And, uh, and there, if x is not in the range, the density is equal to 0. So any questions about discrete and continuous random variables? All right, so just as a quick example, here is a uniformly distributed random variable between 0 and 0.5. In order for the area underneath that density to be equal to 1, the density goes up to 2. So that's an example. For this random variable, uniformly distributed between 0 and 0.5, all of the densities for the range are well above 1. 
they're all equal to 2. But because they only are equal to 2 for a small period from 0 to 5, the area in this rectangle is equal to 1. So that's all that matters. The area in the rectangle has to be equal to 1, but the actual height of the rectangle could be well above 1. In an exponential distribution like this one, the area underneath the exponential has to be equal to 1, but the actual density, like in this case, this is an exponential with mean of 0 0.1. Well, so an exponential with mean of 0.1 at 0, the density goes all the way up to 10. So that's an example that a density can be, doesn't have to be bounded between 0 and 1. It's only the area under it that has to be bounded. The area under it has to be equal to 1. Okay, so uh, then we, the cumulative distribution, this is going to become really important in lectures E1 and E2. CDFs are actually, we're going to see them all throughout the, the last part of the class. Um, so CDFs are often more important than PMFs and PDFs. Uh, a CMF is just the probability. So if I define a CDF as, as big F of argument X, it's the probability that the random variable is less than the argument, less than or equal to the argument. And that definition works for discrete as well as for continuous. And so for discrete, we just add up all of the outcomes that are as big or less than that, than the argument, or uh, we integrate for continuous from negative infinity all the way up to the argument. And so we're just taking area underneath the curve up to the argument. So, uh, and that CDF, as we'll see, ends up being a very useful function. It has all these nice properties, so it's, if you ever see, uh, I'm gonna ask in a second here to see if everybody's paying attention, um, if you see curves that are uh, decreasing, so they go up but then they come down, you know, they can't be CDFs because CDFs are always non-decreasing. You know, the right-hand side of a CDF is always going to be equal to 1. You know, the left-hand side of a CDF is always going to be equal to 0. And if you want to calculate the probability of an integral, and I give you a CDF, you don't have to use the PDF to do that. You can just calculate the CDF at one end of the interval and subtract the CDF at the other end of the interval. So they, they're very handy. Uh, but they have a, a bunch of other nice properties that we'll end up exploiting as we're generating random variables, as we'll see moving into next week. So as an example of kind of to motivate stuff from next week, if I were to give you, uh, say, a service time distribution that was a discrete service time distribution, so just for purposes of the modeling, we said rather than trying to figure out a continuous service time distribution, really we saw that there was a trimodal uh, distribution of service times, and there's such tight clustering that when someone went in to get serviced, they pretty much either took three minutes, six minutes, or ten minutes. Yeah, question. So just real quickly, Dr. T, what you said about like decreasing curves. So you said that any curve that is decreasing, I think, cannot be a CDF. Um, a CDF. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be the area under the curve can be anything. Like for example, what about the normal curve when it is decreasing? The the normal curve. So then that's a PDF. So the normal a PDF of a normal looks like a bell curve, but the CDF of a normal is an S-shaped curve. Oh. So the area underneath it ends up producing this curve, and it'll start at zero and go to one, and it will be non-decreasing everywhere. Oh, so that's if you graph the CDF, right? Right. Oh, okay. And that's boring. So, like in this case, you might imagine there's three types of orders. Somebody came in and they wanted to order, um, let's say, a salad, a burrito, or a quesadilla, just or something like that. And, and so it ends up being convenient just to model them as three different service times rather than modeling variation around those service times. So then you could say, well, you know, 30% of our customers order salads, 45% order burritos, and 25% order quesadillas. And so you've got these things. Now you want to simulate this restaurant. And so you want your simulator to be able to generate service times according to this distribution, according to this one here. Well, it turns out in order to make that easy to do, I generate the cumulative probability, which I've put over here, in which case it always matches in the first. But then I add the, first, uh, the, the second cell here to the first one to get this. So 0 0.3 plus 0 0.45 gives me the 7.5. And then 75 plus 0.25 gives me the 1. Again, all CDFs start from 0, so you can't see the 0 up here, but they always end in 1. So if you're constructing a CDF, 
and your CDF doesn't end in one, then you know that there's something wrong with these probabilities. Once I have that CDF, then we'll see how I can use that in a second because I combine that with this knowledge that, well, okay, so three minute service times occur with 30% probability. Well, I also know that, um, well, I'll see how to draw that in a second. So what I'm saying with the CDF is that if I add an or less here, I say three minute service times or less occur with 30% probability. Six minute service times or less occur with 75% probability. And 10 minute service times or less occur with 100% probability. So that's all I've done is these are equivalent statements, but I've just written them in different ways. I've written them in terms of what these or less in here, and that gives me my CDF. Now, what's useful about that is it, if I plot the CDF here, that's what I've done here, and so this is the exact same table from the previous slide, but I've now plotted big F, of, in this case I did T, but so these are T for time. So these are my different outcomes, 3, 6, and 10. This is the 30% are 3 or less. This is the 75% are 6 or less. And this is the 100% that are 10 or less. Once I've plotted the CDF, if I draw a uniformly distributed random number between 0 and 1, and I plot it on the y-axis, and I see where it brings me back to the x, it will then give me an outcome that if I do this over and over and over again, the outcomes I get will be distributed according to my desired probability mass function. So this is one way that we use CDFs, and this is the inverse transform technique that we'll go into in a lot more detail in lecture E2. In the book, at this point in the book, they refer to this as the random dark transformation. And the idea being that if you drew a straight line and you cut it up proportional to the probabilities that you want, so this section is 30% of the line, this section is 45% of the line, this section is 25% of the line, and you threw a dart that was restricted to that line, and that dart landed randomly anywhere, then it has a greater chance of landing in the larger <coughs> interval. And that's what ends up allowing it to draw the 6 more often than the 3 or the 10. But this so-called random dark transformation is just exactly this inverse transform method. And so plot the CDF, and once you've plotted it, draw a uniformly distributed random number on the y-axis and see what it maps to on the x-axis. And then suddenly you've got a random realization of the desired probability uh, mass function. And then likewise, you can do that for the continuous case. If I plot the CDF of an exponential, so this is the area underneath an exponential curve. That's why it starts at 0 and it goes to 1. If I draw a random number from 0 to 1 on the y-axis, and I see where it hits on the x-axis, then it gives me an outcome, which by itself is just going to be an outcome between 0 and infinity. But if I draw a bunch of them, then it's going to give me more outcomes here and less outcomes over here. It takes the uniform distribution that I'm going to get out of my random number generator, and it stretches it out so that you get a clustering of outcomes here. That's why these are kind of pulled in. And you get an expansion of outcomes here. That's why they're stretched out. So if I were to then take the histogram of the outcomes that I got out of here, it would match an exponential. So again, that's what we'll go over in detail in lecture E2. That's what we're building up to. But it shows that this is how the computers behind the scenes are generating these simple distributions. And then when you need a distribution that ARENA doesn't have, you now will have the capability of doing it because ARENA will give you a uniformly distributed random number between 0 and 1. And you'll be able to write the formula, which turns that into the distribution you want. So that's where we're going. Any questions about that? All right, so uh, the last uh, thing that I'll remind us of is the definition of mean or expected value. So I will use these terms interchangeably, the expected value of x, the mean of x, or the first moment of x. And sometimes I'll use this notation mu x to mean that as well. And for a discrete random variable, it's just this function here. For a continuous random variable, it's this function here. 
sort of the sum of the outcome times its probability or the sum of the outcome or the integral of the outcome times its density. Uh, conceptually, if you were to view the mean, say, of an exponential here, you should think of that as the balance point if you turned the density function into a chunk. This is where it would naturally balance. If you moved it a little bit over or this way, it would tilt one way or the other. So it naturally sits up. So all of this mass balances out. All of this mass is way over here. And this works for discrete random variables as well. So here's the discrete, the probability mass function that I gave earlier. And its mean happens to be here. And if I were to build like a teeter-totter with a bunch of children sitting on it, some that are a little chunkier than others, <laughs> then this is where I'd have to put this to balance out these two versus these four. So, um, and if I were to add another child right at the fulcrum, it wouldn't do anything. So regardless of that other child's weight, it doesn't change the, the balance point. And similarly, if I had, a, let's say I had a distribution of outcomes, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, times that, you know, this is salad and this is quesadilla and these are other foods, if I were to add another food to the list that happened to have a service time that was exactly the mean of my existing service times, it wouldn't change the mean. So if you add things that are at the mean, it doesn't change the mean. So that's one of the other kind of interesting features about the mean. And again, that comes conceptually from this idea that if you put any weight right on the fulcrum, it doesn't actually change the tipping point. All right. Uh, and then we can generalize that to higher order moments. And so when I refer to a higher order moment, it's just the same formulas raised to the n. So the most important higher order moment that we talk about in this class is the variance, which is the second central moment. The variance is equal to the second moment minus the square of the first moment. And so we often give distribution in their statistics in terms of their, their moments here. And so using those moments, you can construct things like variance as opposed to calculating these out manually. So these are kind of the definitions that we care about. And we will use sigma and sigma squared to represent standard deviation and variance. So that's all the review. So any questions about any of that before we move forward on the new stuff? The, I missed the question in the last lecture, but there was a chance to see that I was here. Is that from here? All right. So let's then see how many of you are paying attention. So take 30 seconds and talk to your neighbor and tell me A, B, and C. Evaluate. Is it a PDF, a CDF, or neither? So try to be able to answer that for both for A, B, and C. Tell me what you think they are. So chat amongst yourselves. Bring it back in. So let me see uh, how many people think that A could be a PDF. All right, I don't see a lot of hands. So how many people think A is not a PDF? Okay. So um, so who thinks uh, that A is not a PDF? So why do you think that A is not a PDF? C should be the CDF. Well, oh, they, these are these are independent. So oh. I was just asking generically. A, I just drew three graphs and pretend like they're not related. 
What do you think? Does the area have to equal one under a PDF? How many people say yes? All right, good. Yes, that's the right answer. So yes, for a PDF, the area underneath the PDF has to be equal to one. So just by that criteria, which one of these looks like for sure it's probably not a PDF? If we use the criteria, the area under the curve has to be equal to one, and exactly one. So when I look at these, it may not be clear for some of these whether they meet that criteria or not. But which one of these, when you just ballpark and look at it, looks like it probably doesn't meet that criteria? How many people say A does not, A clearly has an area underneath it that is not equal to 1? How many people say B clearly has an area that's not equal to 1? See a lot more hands there. And I, so I think the rationale there is I have no idea what the actual area is, but I know that it's most of the box. And the box has got 100 on one its side and one on the other side. So the box's area is 100, and it's at least half the box. So there is no way that it's only one underneath here. So I would agree that B can't be a PDF because the area underneath the curve is way too much. How many people think C is likely not a PDF because the area underneath? All right, so I kind of, that's a, I, I, I definitely respect that answer that, that it's hard to, that you look at this and you think, well, we don't really know what happens after one. And so I would you know, say that I would be cautious in calling C a PDF. But if C happened to be zero for everything higher than one, it's still possible that the area in this little space here was equal to 1. So I would be careful in saying that C is not a PDF because it's still possible that the area underneath here might be equal to 1. I think it's probably unlikely, just kind of eyeballing it, but whereas I was able to eyeball B and it was like very clearly greater than 1, I don't think we can necessarily do that here. So I think the evidence suggests that B is definitely not a PDF. But I think the jury might be out a little bit on C. But A, I think it's, it's reasonable to say the area underneath it might be equal to 1. All right, so how many people, so we know that A might be a PDF. So I'll just sort of write the evidence we have down here. So for A, um, we're still not sure if it's a PDF or a CDF. We haven't excluded or neither. For B, saying that it um, is definitely not a PDF. And the question is, is it a CDF or neither? And then C, um, we're not quite sure if it's a PDF. Um, and then we also haven't ruled on it being a CDF or neither. So looking at that, progress. But so now let's look back at A and say, uh, how many people think A, which we're not sure is a PDF, a CDF, or neither, how many people think A is a CDF? How many people think A is not a CDF? All right, so why is A not a CDF? Yeah. Because it has to start at zero and end at one. That's great. It has to start at zero and end at one. It doesn't start at zero. It doesn't end at one. It's decreasing. So right there, we know it can't be a CDF because it's decreasing. And CDFs are always uh, non-decreasing. With that in mind, that gives more evidence that B might be a CDF. Because look, it starts at 0, it ends at 1. It's always non-decreasing. So that's giving us more evidence that B is likely a CDF. In fact, if I go back and think about all my properties for B, I can think of nothing that rules out B as a CDF. This is a totally valid CDF. So I'm going to say that B we figured out is a CDF. A, we're not quite sure it's either a PDF or neither, but my claim is for A, the only way we're going to be able to figure out what it is is to take the area underneath that curve. And so I'm just going to assume that the area underneath that curve is uh, 1, and I'm going to give it a tentative answer of it is a PDF. Now if I look back at C, we said the area underneath the curve, we have no idea. It might be one, it might not be. We do see 
that it is non-decreasing, but is there a reason why C could not be a CDN? And it's already been mentioned. It's increasing, but CDFs are increasing. This one's increasing. So increasing is good. So, pardon? Doesn't end at one. It goes way up to 100. Remember, CDFs are probabilities. Probabilities are bounded between 0 and 1. It is impossible for a CDF to go above 1. It has to start at 0 and end at 1, be non-decreasing in between. So that means C can't be a CDF. It might be a PDF but it also might be neither. So that's kind of our, our answers here. I'll give these a check minus because we're not quite sure without further numerical investigation. But B is definitely a, P, a CDF. Yeah, question. Regarding B being a CDF, shouldn't, I mean, isn't the curve decreasing though because it's located between 0 and 1? Yeah. Isn't that why the curve is decreasing? Well, it's kind of like velocity versus acceleration. The, 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 the velocity, if this is the position, the velocity is always positive. It's just getting slower. So it's always increasing, but its rate of increase is decreasing. So it has diminishing marginal returns, but it does have positive marginal returns everywhere. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Yeah. On C, though, um, on the x-axis, it does go to 1. So. On the x-axis. So it's for the y. Yeah, the, the, right, the y is, so these are outcomes and these are probabilities. Okay, let's do one more. So take 30 seconds, same sort of deal. Make a ruling, what are these things? Are they PDF, CDF, or neither? back in here. So a couple of things before I ask that I want to point out. Weird things compared to the previous ones. Notice that on several of these, they go into the negatives on the x-axis. Several of these go in the negatives on the y-axis. This one is should be weird for all sorts of reasons. And uh, so again, negatives on the x or y-axis, uh, I would just point out those. That's one big difference from last time. So with that in mind, so does anybody have a passionate feeling about D? Is D a, how many people think D is a PDF? All right, good. I don't think D, D is a PDF. And the reason I don't like D for being a PDF um, is that, again, I don't have really a, a strong feeling about this, but it's, it seems unlikely that the area underneath it is equal to 1. Uh, but, I mean... You know, it, because it's going from 0 to 2, and it's going up to 1, so it's like the area in this rectangle is probably 2. And this is only taking off a small bit of it, so it looks like the area underneath here is probably greater than 1. So this is probably not a PDF. How do people feel like D could be a CDF? I didn't see a lot of hands there. So I like that. So CDF, the evidence for CDF is that it starts at 0 and it ends at 1 and it is non-decreasing everywhere. And that actually fits all of our criteria for a CDF. It is okay that the outcomes here go negative, because that just means that sometimes, whatever this random variable is, that, this random variable might be the difference in actual temperature and desired temperature. Well, as we know in this room, sometimes that's negative. Sometimes it's cooler than you'd like it to be. And so it's okay for the outcomes to be negative, and they might most of the time be positive. It's usually too hot in this room. So 
Um, that's kind of what this is showing us here. So that's okay. So I'm going to say that D meets all of our criteria. It's not a PDF, but it does seem to meet the criteria for a CDF. So we'll say D is done. All right, so then let's look at E. How many people think E looks like a PDF? How many people think E might be a CDF? All right, so of the rest of you that think E is not a CDF, to me, at first, E looks similar to this CDF. It's non-decreasing. What's weird about it that makes it not a CDF? Yeah? It has negative probability. It has negative probability, right. For a CDF, the y-axis is probability. And these outcomes go from negative 0.5 up to 2. These are not probabilities that it's mapping to here. So it is definitely not a CDF. And I'm going to say no to the PDF as well because it looks like the area underneath this curve, well, I mean, again, there's, there's negative out, negative, we can't have negative densities as well, so it can't be a PDF. So I'm going to say that E is neither. All right, now what about, uh, let's just go down to F. So how many people think that F could be a CDF? Or why can't F be a CDF? Uh, it's, yeah, decreasing. That's a good one there. And it goes above 1. CDFs can't go above 1. So both of those things tell me that F cannot be a CDF. Now, how many people think that F might be a PDF? I see more hands. How many people don't think F can be a PDF? I don't see any hands. So uh, I think F being a PDF is probably a, a, an exam-worthy answer here, um, given that we, we, we have to really, it's hard to take the area underneath this just by looking at the graph, but um, we can kind of see that it does the things a PDF is supposed to do. All the densities, the supposed densities, are greater than zero. Uh, the area underneath here is plausibly equal to one. So if we think about it, you know, a rectangle that is this wide and this high has area of one, and they, I can kind of see that I can kind of move that around, and that might be the area that's underneath here. So that seems to meet my criteria. So I feel pretty comfortable saying that F is a PDF. All right, so then G. How many people think G is a PDF? How many people think G is a CDF? How many people think G is neither? Right, a lot. And, and the, the hint here is that it's not even a function. So, you know, both PDF and CDF end in F for function. They have to be function. A function, if you give it an, an argument, it should give you one output. And for this, if I, the x-axis here, if I give it one thing in, it gives me two things out. So, what I'm actually looking at here is this is a CDF of actually this PDF down here. So, this is the PDF and this is the corresponding CDF. This is the inverse CDF. So I mentioned earlier, we'll do the inverse transform method, and if I were to have an expression for this and I inverted it, and I drew random numbers between 0 and 1, this gives me a mapping that turns them into this random variable. And this is an inverse PDF, which isn't a thing. PDFs aren't invertible, but CDFs are invertible. That's why when I graphically inverted this PDF, it gave me this thing that's not even a function. So. G is definitely not PDF or CDF, and it's not. Any questions? Yeah. Um, I have two questions. So for D, say like instead of um, coming out at like negative 0.5, if it came out at zero, would that still be okay? Even if like it's zero on the left, it's negative. Uh, I well, so for for E to be the okay to be what a CDF or a yeah. So if you wanted E to be a CDF, the Y values would have to be sandwiched between 0 and 1. And so if you could fix this so it was coming up to 0, and you could make it non-decreasing, and you could guarantee that this little asymptote didn't go higher than 1, then it could be a CDF. So even if it shows like negative on the Y, it, well, it doesn't come out at? The, the blue line has to, so I mean, I guess the fact that this shows the blue here is kind of a red flag. If this was just blue and went all the way to the zero and stopped, as if it was going on to zero until negative infinity, and if this blue stopped at one, 
and then plateaued and then stayed one until infinity on this side, then and only then it could be a CD. And then for F, is it like the total area under the curve, regardless of if it's negative or positive? Uh, well, so the, the area underneath, so because density is always have to be greater than zero, the area underneath the density function will always be greater than zero. And it is the total area from negative infinity to infinity. I mean, just like on the x, like even if it goes up at a negative value, would you not subtract that away from the positive side of the... Well, yeah, when you take the area underneath here, the, the negatives only end up having that subtracting effect if they're on the y-axis. And so the, if you, basically if you took little rectangles and put them under here, it's only the width of the rectangles that matter when you're adding up all those rectangles to get this area. The height of the rectangle is what kind of determines whether you have a negative area or not. So it'll always be a positive area under a, a density function. And that makes sense, because the areas underneath density functions are probabilities, and probabilities are always positive. All right. Good. Any other questions? All right, so um, going forward, you know, today we're going to talk about we're gonna have a few common probabilistic models you should have in mind and be you know, gradually sort of familiar with. Then uh, the next lecture is how to generate those random numbers, which is what you do in homework C2. The lecture after that is how to generate random variants, which are other things other than random numbers between 0 and 1. Uh, then we'll do a midterm review, and then we'll have that midterm. So uh, like I said, motivation, we are trying to build these inputs where our inputs are probabilistic models of variation that go into our simulation. And so that's kind of why probability comes into play, is that before we even do the simulation, we have to model real variation like inter-arrival variation, and we have to pick a good probability distribution. So those probabilistic distributions that go into these variations are what we refer to as the input models for our simulation, the models that go into the simulation. So we need to hopefully get realistic input models to go into our sim, and that will give us realistic variation that comes out of our sim, the same sort of variation you might get out of a manufacturing and test system, for example, or a real airport, or a restaurant, and so on. So if you go on and do more stochastic simulation or stochastic modeling in general, these are the distributions that you should probably have be comfortable with or sort of know off the top of your head. And so this is like in general, even after this class. In this class, I'm mainly going to focus on these ones that I just kind of bolded here. Uniform, triangular, normal, exponential, Erlang, Weibull on the continuous side, and then Poisson, Bernoulli, binomial, negative binomial, geometric on the discrete side. So these are the ones that you're not going to have to you're not going to memorize the formulas for, but you should memorize roughly what they're shaped like, how they're used, what they're used to model, and so on. So let's get into that. So I'm going to give sort of a brief overview of each one of these, introduce you to these as they come through, so you can understand how best to use them. So the one that we've already been a little bit familiar with is this uniform distribution, which is going to be denoted UAB, which means it's going to have a uniform density from A to B. So there's a uniform, if you've got the same width interval, it has the same probability of outcomes, regardless of where that interval is, is along this, the outcome space, the range. The CDF for uniform, you should get, whenever you see ramps in a CDF, you should see, oh, that's uniformly distributed. <coughs> so this stuff, again, is hopefully kind of just review here. Places where we use the uniform is where we go to the customer and they say, we know that the minimum is this and the maximum is that, we can't really tell you anything else. In that case, this is sometimes the best you can do. It just say, all right, then for now, until you can give me more data or more info, I'm going to model this as being uniformly distributed between the min that you gave me and the max. Now, sometimes your customer comes back and says, we know it's never less than this. We know it's never more than that. but..." It's usually about this. And that's where we get this triangular distribution. So there's stats on the uniform here. I'm just going to skip over. So the triangular distribution is kind of like the uniform's big brother. It's like it has the same bounds on outcomes, A and B, but you get to define another outcome as being most likely. 
and that's the mode of the distribution. And so it, a triangular looks like this because you've got a line. If you integrate under a line, you get a square. So you get this. Uh, uh, so you get a, a, an S-shaped curve that looks kind of like x squared and then negative x squared. And so whenever you see, you know, you're always going to see S-shaped curves, but it looks especially S-shaped, like it's got this linear increase uh, in the slope, then that's sort of your triangular distribution. And there's the inflection point will be the mode. So in a triangular distribution, when you're looking at the CDF, the inflection point in the CDF is the mode. So if somebody asks you what's the most likely and they give you a CDF of a triangular, just look for the inflection point. And you can say, well, usually it's this one right over here. So triangular distributions are useful, again, when they, you only know the min and the max, uh, and they also give you that mode. The other one that's sort of like you don't know anything else about the system that you'll often use is the normal distribution, which you should be probably pretty familiar with right now. You've probably seen it a lot. It's a, you know, a common model for variance. This one is the one you use if somebody says, we know that this process, this variation coming in, these arrival times or whatever, they have this average and they have this variance, but that's all that we've taken down. We don't have raw data for you. All we have is the mean and the variance, or the mean and the standard deviation. And it turns out that the, uh, the best, sort of the least unbiased, or the least biased distribution you can get if somebody gives you just the mean and the variance, and it's possible for the outcomes to go all the way to negative infinity and all the way to positive infinity, is a normal distribution. So that's one of the places this comes from. Now the other place that this comes from where you get a little bit more info is if you think you have a sum of independent random variables, then you use that central limit theorem. So you might, you know, whenever you look at, um, like if you look at this door, there's kind of a shinier region in the middle and it gets dull on the other two sides here. And that pattern of shiny in the middle and dull on the two sides is actually following a normal distribution because over time it's had people pushing on this door in random spots and all of that wear adds up. And we know that random variables that are independent as they add up, the sum has a normal distribution. So if you're modeling something, let's say in a factory, and you know that it's a process where over time there's repeated fatigue on that, and you want to model sort of what that the sum of all of that repeated fatigue will be, a normal is a good choice. So that's kind of the two times you use a normal is when you, they either only give you mean and standard deviation and no other data, or, uh, and you're pretty confident it goes from negative infinity to infinity, or the mean is way, 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 uh, you know, in the positives so that the negative outcomes are super unlikely. Or you actually have some prior knowledge that there's additive wear. I can guarantee you if you pulled up this carpet and you looked at the carpet pad underneath it, then it would also have kind of a, a like, uh, you can actually see it here. When people come in, there's sort of a, a wear pattern where it's, it actually was a pretty good carpet here, halfway decent carpet here, and then it's really blurry here. But if you were to model this kind of density, if you were to cut through this, it would look like a normal distribution because you've got this additive wear process where people come in and they independently walk in roughly the same spot. And if you add up all that independent wear, you get a normal distribution. So that's those three, we sort of say are the arbitrary distributions. You kind of pick them when you have no other data. The next distributions, which I'm all grouping into what I call the kind of exponential family, are when you actually do have a little bit more structure in your system. So are there any questions about those three? That makes sense that these are sort of the ones in which you use when you're not given a whole lot of other info. Or maybe you think there's an additive process. The important thing here that I want you to, to uh, that I want to emphasize is that the normal has a range from negative infinity to infinity. There, if you look at inventory uh, management problems, which uh, we've talked about in previous lectures, they frequently need a distribution for the demand distribution, how much demand is coming in per day. And out of convenience, a lot of modelers use a normal distribution. But you have to be really, really careful in that case because unless you're really comfortable that your mean, and your mean is very, very large, and your variance is very, very small, then that demand distribution 
can maybe generate negative demands. And your sim might just move right along because your math might not catch it. And so you might end up you know, finding that, that someday somebody orders minus five products. And your sim doesn't care. It doesn't know that that's a bad thing. So if you ever use a normal, make sure you know, you say to yourself, is it possible that this thing, in appreciable probability, may give me negative outcomes? And am I OK with that? If it's not OK with that, but I really want it to be a normal, then I need to make sure that I discard those negative outcomes or use something called a truncated normal. So there are all these special cases. So, but the big thing I want to emphasize here is that when you use a normal, make sure you're comfortable with the possibility that some of your outcomes might be negative. Although they might be improbable, they still could happen. All right, so then the kind of the start of this like exponential family is the exponential distribution. So you've hopefully seen this plenty of times before. Kind of looks like this kind of subtle ski slope. And if you ch it has a single parameter, which we refer to as the rate. And one over the rate gives us the mean of the distribution. Its CDF, unlike a lot of others, is not S-shaped like most CDFs. It has this monotonic increase. And so that's kind of very distinct in the exponential. So when do we use the exponential? Well, the exponential, the fundamental property of an exponential, which you should know from any queuing theory classes you've taken, like 470, is that it is memoryless. What do we mean by memoryless? We mean that if you model something as an exponential, then what you're saying is that the time that you have already waited for an event to happen that hasn't happened doesn't give you any information about how much more time you have to wait. So the example I got here is that if you've operated for five minutes, the probability the machine would die in minute eight is equal to the probability, starting from the five minutes, that the machine will die in three minutes. So if you sort of normalize for what your history, you end up landing in the same distribution you would have gotten at if you didn't have that history. That's what we mean by having, mem or having no memory. So some students might want to model, for example, the time uh, until a bus comes at the next bus stop. Well, that is something you do not want to model with an exponential distribution. Because you know a bus comes at a roughly regular schedule. You walk up to a bus stop and you see a lot of people are waiting there. You know that the bus is probably going to come sometime soon because you wouldn't accumulate a lot of people waiting because it, you know, if you came to an empty bus stop, the bus probably already came. So because a bus, you can use that, you can ask somebody, how long have you been waiting? And they say, oh, I've been waiting for eight minutes. And you say, oh, I know the bus comes every 10 minutes. So in that case, I'm willing to wait for this one. Otherwise, you say, oh, shoot, well, if, you, you know, if you've only been waiting for a minute, for all I know, the bus just came, and I don't want to wait another nine minutes, I'll keep walking. So that is one where the memory of how long you've waited affects the probability of how much more time there is to wait. If you don't have that memory, then you can likely model it with an exponential distribution. Failure times are a great example of that. Um, I know that there is an expected lifetime of this laptop. But knowing that I've used it for two years probably doesn't give me a good prediction of when it's going to fail beyond the original failure time distribution when I first got it. So knowing that I've had it for two years doesn't really help. Now, if you take reliability courses, you'll find out that eventually, when this laptop's 10 years old, yeah, I know that it's pretty much on its way out. So things start exponential, but then they end up getting they end up gaining memory over time, but they are approximately memoryless initially when you get there. So if you, um, you know, so then we're going to add to that expo. Any questions about memorylessness? Map property. And again, this is a one parameter distribution. Its mean and variance are both determined by the same parameter, this lambda, this rate parameter. So the mean is 1 over that. The variance is 1 over that squared. And so the standard deviation is equal to the mean. That's another kind of interesting thing about this. And if someone gives you just a mean, if they say to you, here's the mean, I have no idea what the, I don't have data for how often people arrive at my restaurant. But I know on average they arrive one every two minutes. And I know that it's an arrival time, so it can't be negative. 
In that case, the exponential, if you have no other data, is the least unbiased distribution to choose. And if you want more details on what I mean by least unbiased, I can give you that. But in short, if all you know is the mean and that it's non-negative, the exponential is what you should choose until you get more information about the structure of the mean. All right. So then from the exponential, then a big question is, what happens when I add exponentials up together? I mentioned failure time distributions. So if I know that a light bulb is going to fail, what am I going to usually do in order to hedge against failure? So I, these batteries are almost dead. What should I have done to allow me to continue to use the laser pointer without worrying about them? Buy new batteries, or in the case of this class, bring new batteries. And if I would have brought Two, you know, two sets of batteries, then I wouldn't have to, I, I wouldn't care just about the failure distribution for one set of batteries. I would care about the sum of those two. I would say, all right, I don't actually need to know how long it takes for one pair of batteries to, uh, to allow this clicker to work. I now need to know, given that one pair of batteries fails and then I immediately put in the batteries, how long do I get for two pairs of batteries? Well, that is the Erlang distribution. So if you, it's the sum of exponentials. If I have two random variables that are both exponentially distributed, and I add them together, the Erlang 2, so notice there's the Erlang k, is going to be the distribution of their sum. So if an Erlang 1, k equals 1 here, that's this red line, it not surprisingly looks like an exponential. An Erlang 2 is this orange line, which is kind of down here, and notice that it now hardly has any density at zero. It creates kind of a hump. And it gets more humpy as the k values go up. As they start adding more exponentials, it gets more hump-shaped and more symmetric. Why is it not surprising that as I increase the k value and add more exponentials, this distribution starts looking more symmetric than hump-shaped? Yeah. The central limit theorem, exactly. So if you look at this density function, if you take k to infinity, the limit of this density function is the normal. So an Erlang k, as k goes to infinity, just becomes a normal distribution. So whereas the central limit theorem kind of tells you if you add up a whole lot of them, what does it look like? This is very specific. If you add up a finite number of exponentials, what does it look like? And fortunately, it lands in the same spot as the central limit, limit theorem, so that's good. But it allows us to be more precise. And so, whereas if I don't quite know exactly what the distribution of where people are going to put their hands on this bar as they exit, here I'm saying I do know that these batteries individually fail with an exponential distribution. And so if I add up, you know, one set of batteries, and then my redundant set of batteries, and then my redundant, redundant set of batteries. So then I say, well, what are my three sets? How long will they last? Well, that's an Erlang 3, which is maybe this yellow one, which means that they, I'm definitely, they're definitely not going to die immediately, because if one dies immediately, it's extremely unlikely that the other two will die immediately. But I do start getting a hump where I know that, you know, by time four, um, you know, I lose that memorylessness. I start being able to count on that, you know, by, you know, four years, you know, then I'm going to start getting a decrease in probability that things are going to last. But so they're, they're probably going to last up to four years, but not after that. So adding up exponentials is Erlang. That's one way to reshape an exponential. The other way is that if you've taken a reliability course, you've then probably seen the Weibull distribution. And this is the second exponential-like distribution that has a special shape parameter. And so just like the Erlang, it has a lambda, or in this case, uh, mu. So mu and lambda are just one over the other. And it also has the shape parameter k. But now k doesn't have a convenient conceptualization like adding up exponentials. k is just an index of shape. And so the way we view a Weibull is it is something that is like a mod, if I make k equal to 1, it is an exponential. But if I make k less than 1, it gets even more ski sloped. If I make k greater than 1, it gets more hump shape. 
And so reliability engineers really like Weigel distributions because they degenerate into exponentials, which is kind of like what we hope everything acts like. But they allow for us to model failures that are more often to occur late with high k values or failures that are more often to occur early with low k values. So there are some products that like 10% of them just fail immediately. Uh, and so that's why we have burn-in periods in factories. We burn them in, the ones that survive the burn-in period are the ones that we think we can sell because those that survive that act kind of like an exponential after that. But then most products eventually get into a regime where they might have acted you know, roughly exponential for a while, but then start failing late. And so the longer they live, there's a higher chance that they're going to fail. And that's kind of like this hump-shaped one where there's probably not going to fail here, but they will fail out here. And so if you have a machine that you're modeling in your simulation and you think that you want it to never, ever, ever fail early, but you want it to be very likely to fail at a particular time, then a libel distribution is often a good sh uh, fit for that. Now I bring these both up as this exponential family because the shapes look very similar. And when we get into input modeling tools, the tools are going to maybe give you a libel when an Erlang makes more conceptual sense or vice versa. And the tool has no idea what the background context is on it. But it'll be, it'll be up to you to say, I'm going to ignore the Weibull suggestion and take the Erlang suggestion because that makes more sense to me. So that's why we try to, to build up some sort of uh, a feeling for what the backgrounds of these things are. And then the last exponential one is a discrete one that you should turn about in your, like, again, like 470, and that's the Poisson. So a lot of people get confused about it. A Poisson random variable is discrete. An exponential is continuous. A Poisson is a count of events that occur with exponential waiting times in between them. So I might know that every student arrives with an average of, say, 30 seconds in between them, some longer, some more. But if I wanted to ask how many students arrive in a minute, how many students arrive in five minutes, the how many question is answered by the Poisson. So it is a count of events that occur with exponential waiting times in between. So are there questions about that, about the distinction between a Poisson and an exponential, how they're related and how they're not? If I ask you, you know, like to model, if I, if I ask you about a continuous time, you might feel the urge to say, oh, that's Poisson distributed, because I remember Poisson processes, which I'll mention here in a second. But Resist that urge because a Poisson can only be used if it's discrete, if it's a number question, if it's a how many question. If it's a how long question, it's an exponential. If it's a how many, it's a Poisson. All right, so that's the exponential family. So before I go into the third family that I want you to care about, there are any questions about these four, exponential, Weibull, Erlang, All right, and then the last ones are all built on this Bernoulli trial. So a Bernoulli trial is just a coin flip. And a coin, if it's a fair coin, it'll land heads and tails with equal probability. If it's an unfair coin, it'll be biased towards one side or the other. But all of them we refer to as a Bernoulli trial. And it just has, again, this out, that it'll get a one with some probability and a zero with one minus that probability. And we can then build up these different distributions based on how many coins come up heads under these different conditions. So a binomial distribution is just the distribution that says if I flip the coin n times and each time has a success probability of p, how many successes do I get? So it's like it's kind of like the Poisson where I am counting the number of events that occur in an interval of time. But my interval of time are, is discretized into coin flips. And so if I were to say every 15 seconds did a student arrive, I might be able to model that as well every 15 seconds there's a certain probability a student arrives, say it's 20%. And then I can ask, given that every 15 seconds there's a 20% chance a student arrives, in a minute, how many students arrive? And that would be modeled as a binomial distribution. And we will end up finding later, when we start talking about chi-squared and things like that, 
relationships between things like binomial distribution or Poisson distribution. So it's like the discrete analog of a Poisson where we're counting based on probability instead of based on time. So the, uh, the next one then is this negative binomial. So it's got a funny name for technical reasons, but in the negative binomial, we're asking a slightly different question. We're asking how many trials do I need to get a certain number of successes. So before, it was given that I gave these many trials and each one had a success, how many successes do I get? This is different. This is saying, how long do I have to wait in order for me to get a certain number of successful trials? So that's what this R is. How, these are the successes that I want. P is the chance that each trial is a success. And then the output here, X, that is how many trials I'll have to wait. So you know that x is probably then going to be bigger than r because I can't get r if I have less than that number of trials. But I might need to go 100 trials to get two successes if I have a very low probability. And then, uh, so those are kind of Bernoulli binomial, negative binomial. Before I then switch uh, briefly into processes, when we wrap up, are there questions about these Bernoulli-based random variables. All right. So the last thing that you need to know um, is the difference between a random variable and a random process. So a random process is an indexed family of random variables. So as an example, um, a counting process is a, has a random variable which is re represents the count of events up to a particular time. And the whole family is indexed by all the possible times I could ask about. It. So you might be familiar, again, from classes like 470 with a Poisson counting process. A Poisson counting process, which is commonly used in these queuing ones, basically says that the number of arrivals by a particular time is Poisson. And so if the number of arrivals by a particular time is Poisson, and I collect all of those random variables for all times, then that collection of random variables is a Poisson process. And Poisson processes have all sorts of nice features. For example, I just mentioned the number of arrivals up to a particular time is Poisson distributed. But also, the time between arrivals is exponentially distributed. So those are the two things that you should think about. Whenever somebody says, model that as a Poisson process, what they're saying, and these it turns out are equivalent statements, is put an exponential waiting time between encounters, or model the other way, use a Poisson random variable to count how many encounters occur in a chunk of time that we define ahead of time. So that's kind of the limit of what, um, I want to at least be familiar with the idea of a process, what, why a Poisson process, and most of the other stuff. Um, so I, if you review these slides online, after this summary, I give a bunch of additional info and that info is summarizing these details that I've already mentioned. So when would you use, uh, say, uh, the Weibull distribution and reliability and so on and so forth. So if you want to read more details about that, I pack them in into these application section of these slides. But the big things that I need you to know for now is just basically this list of, uh, of distributions, roughly how they're used, and the difference between a random variable and a random process in the definition of a Poisson process. So if you have any questions, come up and ask me after. And let's do an attendance question for today. And that attendance exercise will be, um, what distribution represents a sum of exponential random variables? What's the most accurate best distribution that represents a small number of, of exponentials added together? So a small number, a finite number of exponential bands together, what is that distribution?
the meeting on uh, Thursday. Thursday. Yeah, as usual. Unless any questions come up ahead of time, just let me know. Okay, thank you.